might have questions about his work uh, and his presentation. Uh, before I introduce our speaker tonight, I want to just let us know that uh, next week we've got uh, Yanni Naiman, and she's going to talk about uh, regional stratigraphic patterns in the Indus River system, a little bit of source to sink dealing with the uh, Indus fan. And then we've got Advait Junkar, uh, who I think will be talking about uh, paleontology uh, of the Shawaliks. And then our last seminar is going to be in uh, three weeks from now on the 14th of uh, July in Pakistan. I think that's the 13th of July here in the United States. And uh, we haven't quite organized it completely yet. We might have Dr. Uh, Imran Khan from uh, the GSP. And, uh, and I might also have myself giving sort of an overview of the uh, seminar series. Uh, I've been taking notes, as have many of you, and uh, I'm, I'm prepared to give sort of a, a, a synopsis of the, of the whole series. So that'll take place uh, three weeks from now. Uh, tonight uh, and this morning in Pakistan, uh, we're welcoming Shahid Iqbal from uh, the Department of Earth Sciences from Qadi Azam University in uh, Islamabad. And Shahid's actually in, uh, in Vienna, in, in Austria right now. And uh, he's had a, 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 a long and international career. He's worked on many different topics, uh, stratigraphy of the salt range back in the Mesozoic. And he's currently working on issues in the in the Peshawar Basin, including uh, the current history of, of mankind and the archaeological record uh, as the Anthropocene comes into the uh, Peshawar Basin area. So he's got a tremendous range of, of interests uh, in stratigraphy, uh, and uh, we're welcoming him tonight. He's going to give a lecture entitled Paleo Environmental and Provenance Analyses of the Pleistocene to Holocene sediments of the Peshawar Basin in, in Pakistan. But he's got a, a very broad background. Uh, he's currently a, a researcher uh, at, at Qadi Azam University, but he's, he's, he has a position also in the uh, Department of Geology at the University of Vienna in Austria. And he's coming to us uh, t this morning uh, from, from Vienna. So he had to get up early in the morning to give this presentation. But I, I think that you'll find that his his interest, as reflected in his abstract and, and his vita on the flyer, are very broad. And I'm delighted to welcome Shahid Iqbal to our presentation. So I'll turn the floor over to you, uh, Dr. Iqbal. Thank you. Thank you, Bob, for your nice introduction. And good morning, good evening. What we say, good midnight to everyone for <laughs> colleagues all around the world. And thanks for being here. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to present my limited ideas on the subject of the Plastocene Holocene situation in the Peshawar Basin. And in today's talk, I'll talk about the paleo environmental analysis and provenance analysis of the Plastocene Holocene sediments in the Peshawar Basin, Pakistan. We go straight into the subject. The presentation scheme is. There will be an introduction to the area and then the, what research questions are there, what we will be focusing on and what methodologies will be used to work out those research questions and what are the results based on the methodology used and what we expect, what we conclude from those results. So. The. Area is in Pakistan, and Pakistan is located in the western part of South Asia. So this is the regional context of the country. In the north are the Himalayas mountain, and in the south of the country is the Arabian Sea. This is the area. Now, the area, the Peshawar Basin, is located in northwest Pakistan, and we all know that northwest Pakistan is an area which is part of the Himalayan four-lane thrust belt, and this is the hinterland zone of the four-lane, four, uh, hinterland zone of the four-lane thrust belt. This is the Peshawar Basin, bounded to the north in a crude way by the main mental thrust milan zone, and to the south are the Panjal Khairabad Fart and the main boundary thrust area. This is the high resolution or zoom in 
geological image or map of the Peshawar Basin. In the north are these Mesozoic and Paleozoic metasediments and some igneous granitic rocks with some ophiolites. To the south are the Mesozoic and younger sediments close to the main boundary thrust. And the red sections are the uh, Pleistocene Holocene sediments within the basin. There is the drainage system in the basin from west to east is the, the Kabul River system and from east to west is the Indus River system and they join near Attak and then they become north south. So what research questions were in focus? The aim of uh, this work was to understand the sedimentation style and that is, of course, a response to the paleoclimatic fluctuation during the Pleistocene Holocene time in the Peshawar Basin. And then this question or these questions can be solved if we are able to interpret the paleo depositional conditions by reconstructing the facies architecture within the basin. And then the geochemical proxies or whatever proxies were used, these were to reconstruct the paleoclimate and what glacial and interglacial events, if any, could be fine in the area. And then, of course, the sediment generation sites, knowing about the sediment generation sites, what area were the source of the sediments and how these were transported to the Peshawar Basin, so the provenance analysis. So, Looks like someone clicked something. Yeah, methodology. So methodology, we focused on outcrop sampling at at least six different locations, three in an east-west transit and three sections in a north-south transit to cover the basin. Outcrop were focused on high resolution samples at 10 to 20 centimeter interval. Then the framework mineralogical compositions were petrographic studies were performed, and then the bulk mineralogical composition was studied using X-ray diffraction analysis. And the clay mineralogy of the oriented samples from the clay and silts were performed to understand the mineral mineralogical behavior of the clays and bulk sediment geochemistry. Now, before selling my product. I want to tell you that there are always limitation in data collection. Outcrop is the best in the high resolution data sets available for study, but there are limitation. Outcrop may be covered some, in some area. The base may not be exposed in some area, especially in this Peshawar Basin, the Pleistocene and the Holocene is, is subject to the anthropogenic activity, so the record may not be complete. The framework composition is subject to human bias, of course. Sampling and sampling cannot be complete. The bulk mineralogical record is based on the XRD, and this is only used for the identification of the mineral species present. It cannot be a very direct quantitative, but it is sort of semi-quantitative. Clay mineralogy is important, but again, the technique that is used gave us an approximate with some percentages of error experts knows about it. And the bulk mineralogy, uh, bulk sediment geochemistry, ICPMS was used. And uh, here we, we should uh, be able to know that uh, there is a bias because we cannot separate the, the framework from the matrix and the diagenetic influence can also be there. So these are the limitation, but keeping these limitation in mind, we will proceed with the results. This is the succession. The Peshawar Basin has an almost complete Paleozoic rock record. And on top of that, this the, the so-called Jalousai formation are the Pleistocene Holocene sediments are deposited in response to the uplift of the architecture ranges around the start of the Pleistocene time. This is from the uh, existing rock record around 
2.8 or 2.5 million years ago, the Atakchara range starts to uplift. And uh, this uplift is considered to be associated with the deposition of these interbedded conglomerate sand and silt in some area and interbedded sand and silt and interbedded clays and silt or lust deposits in some area. So the stratigraphic sections in the area. Uh, you can see one, two, three, four, five, six stratigraphic sections were selected for the study. Three in east-west and uh, three in, in east-west direction and three in north-south direction. Here is a representative photograph from the very re recent sediments of uh, on the bank of the Kabul River near Nushera. And uh, the field result revealed the presence of three facies association at the base in a complete normal succession. Idealized succession, the flood, uh, floodplain lithofacies association consists of mostly clays with silt and some uh, uh, soil horizons. And then these are overlain by dominantly lacustrine floodplain sediments, the lacustrine fluvial lithofacies association. And on top of these, there are the lust lithofacies association, which consists of the lust deposits. We, we will we will have a detailed look at all these succession. Uh, some field photographs. You can see these laminated clays, which are bentonite rich in mine at the yeah, southern part of the basin near the Noshera area for uh, the clays and these clay succession are consisting of 15 to 22 centimeter thick cycles. You can see the lower part is laminated and then the upper part is a bit clay in color and generally topped by these red clays part, two to three centimeter thick. Then there are multiple Alluvial fan layers, interbedded lacustrine layer, and then another alluvial layer. Then in between there are the last deposits also. More photographs which we can discuss later if there are questions. In the southern part, we see some fine silt clay mixed with uh, the pebbles of uh, slates mostly. And uh, uh, we can we can talk about these photo photographs later if there are questions. And in other parts, we see huge boulders, tons size boulders, lying which are apparently not related to the sediments. So what these are, we we will discuss these. Now let's talk about the geochemistry still. We have selected a representative section of the Jalala which has the, 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 the um, flat flame lithofacies, very thick lacustrine, fluvial lithofacies, and the lust lithofacies. And we see that all the proxies, the rubidium versus strontium, the barium versus strontium, the aluminum, um, alumina versus sodium, they are indicating a shift from very high ratios to low ratio at the contact of these uh, um, flood flame, uh, flood flame, uh, and the lacustrine uh, uh, fluvial lithofacies. And similarly, a change is observed at the contact of the uh, lacustrine uh, fluvial lithofacies and the overlying lust lithofacies. But generally, if we look at the ratios, are in, in very low range. In very really low range, like there is not a very high range, and in some parts the calcium content is increasing. Look at here, similarly here, part here, and then if we look at the chemical index of alteration, which is generally used as a proxy for weathering, and weathering is then li linked to climate. The values are generally low, less than about 70, 75, but even then the lower part 
indicate slightly higher value. The, the lecostrin fluvial part has very low stable values and the onset of these lust deposits is indicating a spike, but still low. So what what can be the possible logic behind it? We have then used the chemical index of alteration against the alumina content, which is an indication, a proxy used for the paleoclimate interpretation. The lower values are generally reflecting the arid condition to subtropical conditions. I cannot change the terminologies. The, the arid, the subtropical and tropical, these are used in the Goldberg and Humming units. So I'm taking those, but I'm adding these semi-humid and hot and humid from my side. The, the brown are, are the yellowish brown are the less lithophases association. The blue are the uh, fluvial uh, plain lithophage, uh, the flat plain lithophage association and the gray one are the lecostrine fluvial lithophage association. So you can see that most of the lecostrine fluvial lithophage association are reflecting arid conditions of deposition. There is some sort of tendency toward increase in humidity and weathering in the flood plain lithophage association and the lust deposits are also mostly in the arid condition again in the potassium versus uh, sodium plot against the chemical index of alteration the same thing is reflecting the lust and the lecostrine uh, fluvial deposits are reflecting arid conditions of deposition while the uh, flood plain clays are indicating some sort of increasing in weathering and some sort of increasing in humidity. Then to cross check those, we are using the AC and K plots and uh, the chemical proxy of weathering to know whether the proxies used previously are giving reliable result or there are some sort of changes. Uh, to the left are the chemical index of filtration values for all the lithophages association. The less lithophages association, you can see 50, 7,500. So anything about 75 means very high weathering. Generally, uh, sediments don't display values less than 50. So this is this is for fresh granite and for uh, gabbros, these are 45 to 50. So we can see that the sediments are indicating very poor chemical weathering, which is generally the characteristic of cold and arid dry climates or desert climates. Now we look at the weathering trends of the sediments. The lust deposits and the lecostrine deposits are indicating less weathering, while the uh, floodplain clays are indicating more weathering. So you look at these these uh, uh, reference sample. This is the upper continental crust, and this is the average continental crust. The the less uh, deposits and part of the lacustrine are close to it, and, and an increasing trend toward the post Austrian uh, Archean um, Australian shale, which is used as a global average, and the not American shale composite. They are indicating a weathering trend, but still this, this weathering trend looks to be first cycle because they are going toward the elite, which is a product of arid climate and cold climate, poor weathering. They are not indicating anything of Kevlinite. We will see these in the clay mineralogy. Similarly, if you look at the plot, which is discriminating between the arid and humid climate, all the sediments are in semi-arid arid climate range. So humid mean, here mean things which are favoring increasing chemical maturity and chemical weathering. Let's go further. Based on these uh, geochemical proxies and we collected samples for clay mineralogy and clay minerals can be used as sort of direct indication of the weathering condition. Kevlinar generally reflects very high 
weathering condition while vermiculite and smectite indicate poor condition. Smectite also indicate poorly drained areas. So if we look at the fluvial plain lithofaces association, which is marked here in red, the values are stable, but the kaolinite by elite ratio is low, it's stable, which means there is less kaolinite. The smectite by elite ratio is indicating an increase in the smectite content, indication of a change toward poorly drained areas, generally lakes. Similarly, the smectite what uh, divided by elite and chloride is also an in indicating an increase in the smectite content. And smectite is generally common in poorly drained lakes, poorly weathered areas, so probably the environment is shifting toward some sort of poor drainage. And, and then in, in the middle part of the succession, you can see a very fluctuating spiky conditions. So this is probably an indication of some sort of change. You can see very sudden increase in smectite, sudden increase in smectite. Here the samples are plotted only representative, so there are samples in the middle parts also. While the kaolinite is attesting the increase in smectite because the decreased kaolinite almost goes to zero. This means that there was some sort of activity which was inhibiting chemical weathering and that can be glacial or cold condition or poorly weathering condition while the lust deposits are also indicating poor weathering because of less kaolinite smectite high amount a light is a bit higher also and the other proxy now let's see these in, in numerical values in the lower part in the uh, floodplain lithofaces association, we can see, look at the red is elite, okay? Very high amount of elite. The gray is kaolinite, which generally stays low. And the blue is the chemical index of alteration, generally staying around 70, but the significant contrast is the change in this black and green line. You can see green is almost flat here. This is where micolite, or you can call it the, 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 the poorly degraded clays. Poorly degraded clays are common in the middle part, which are the lacustrine fluvial lithofaces association. So this is giving an idea about some sort of poorly drained areas. While the red, is, it's, uh, which is elite, is indicating a bit of drop in this area and then again sudden rise. So elite is a product of arid climatic conditions. The increasing elite in the in the floodplain and in the uh, last lithofaces association is indication of the cold and arid condition. While the presence of vermiculite and other degraded clay in the middle part and the lacustrine part is an indication of poor weathering under Aqueous condition, subaqueous conditions. So this probably may be supporting the idea of lakes forming in the Peshawar Basin. Earlier this was sort of exposed conditions, then lakes and then sort of exposed conditions again. Then based on these results, we are trying to correlate the finding within the Peshawar Basin to the ocean drilling side, side, the ODP side within the Arabian Sea for the same time interval. And for the MIA, MIS, marine isotopic stages, which is globally known, and also the nearby Chinese lust series. And we come up with the finding that the lower part, which is the floodplain clays, probably were deposited during the post Chanoz interglacial interval. The red here is indication of a bit warm, not, not very hot and humid, but a bit warm in comparison to the other timing. And then the blue part is mainly the lacustrine fluvial lithofaces association, 
which overall indicates the cold conditions, cold in terms of temperature and arid in terms of the availability of weathering conditions. And in between, there are some intervals of a bit humid conditions which indicates a bit stimulating weathering conditions. So probably the first one is, is correlating to the post Yun's interglacial event in the Himalaya. And this is followed by something which correlates with the Borigil glacial interval around 100,000, uh, 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 100 kilo years. And then there is another interglacial time with a little humid, not very hot, but humid uh, uh, even because we find the laminated sediment. And this is probably the post uh, geoglacial interglacial interval. And then another event which spans between 40 to, we can say, 20 kilo years. Probably this links to the uh, LGM, the latest glacial maximum time where we have huge boulders and uh, last deposits. Uh, you saw that boulder in, in, in the last photograph, which otherwise had no relationship, and multiple drop stones in the sediment. So these are the local correlation, and of course the recent sediment on the bank of the Carver River indicating the, the interglacial, the, the Holocene optimum condition. And these correlate with the, the 5E, 5A um, interglacial uh, glacial event and, and the termination of the glaciation around 14 kilo and also with the S0 and S1 uh, series of the Chinese last series and also the glacial interval, the L2 and L1. So this is the, the, the regional and the global correlation tentative one based on the process. The red signal in this ODP side is for the pluvial event. Pluvial events, warming events, rainfall events were recorded here. And we we think that it is correlating to our warming event also. While here are based on the oxygen isotopes increase in the in the delta O eighteen values. And this one is, is linked on the magnetic susceptibility. Increase in magnetic susceptibilities are used as proxies. And of course, the dark one here is, is this sea surface temperature, is this ODP side of the Arabia. So, so the, the increase in, in sea surface temperature also correlates with A. Now, the finding of the first part are that it apparently looks like the uplift of the architecture art ranges triggers some sort of flooding within the Peshawar Basin via lake formation around 2.8 million years ago or 2800 kilo years ago. And generally within this lake formation setting, cold and arid climate prevailed. And uh, in, within this setting, the lacustrine and the fluvial sediments would generally are considered as the, the lake deposits of the Peshawar basins were deposited and they show good synchronized correlation with the MIS stages and uh, the regionally deposits, uh, deposited Chinese dust series within the same time interval. So these are the finding of the first phase. Now we come to the provenance. We look at the provenance signals the point counting data indicates the the absence of uh, sediments derivation from our dominantly arcosic setup or dominantly magmatic setup and generally favored the the, the collusional hole and thrust belt setup but this is very crude because nowadays people are questioning questioning the utility of these qfl plots the quartz grain types and the case that probably sediments were derived mostly from plutonic to middle ring metamorphic rocks, granites or schistose rocks, and there is little contribution from, from slates, mostly in the central and northern parts. There is some contribution from slates in the southern parts, but in the northern and central parts, there is this contribution. 
now the sand grain type classification for uh, the arcoses are for the sands reveals dominantly shale all the lithophysis association are falling away from the quartz arenite which are generally deposited in high rain weathering hot and humid condition and of course not so much iron oxidation so gravity and shell type of sediments are indicated which is again an indication of some sort of low energy deposition lakes and other things the geochemical proxies plots for the uh, uh, tectonic setting discrimination were used and uh, the uh, the uh, rare earth and the trace elements were used. The hofnium plot and the lanthanum and thorium plots indicates that there is nothing coming from the oceanic island arc or the andesitic island arc. And similarly, there is very little material coming from passive margin setting in both the plots. Most of the materials are coming from active continental margin settings. To take, carry the story further, uh, lanthanum, thorium, scandium plots were used because scandium generally preserves its signals and it is compatible compatible with magmatic chamber, while thorium and uranium are generally concentrated in the acidic part. They are not compatible with the chamber, so we see that there is nothing coming from the oceanic island arc, and also nothing coming here from active and passive margins, some sort of continental island arc setup seems to be providing the sediments. However, there is a limitation. This plot is unable to discriminate between active and passive margins. So thorium, scandium and zirconium plots were used. Which discriminates and again it negates sedimentation in an oceanic island arc setting and passive margin setting. And there is a limitation of this plot also because it has no proxies for basic rocks apart from scandium. So we use cobalt also, and cobalt is also negating sediment derivation from the oceanic arc settings and the passive margin settings. So all the settings are in favor of some, some sort of active tectonics in continental setting. Now, what were the probable sources? Vanadium, nickel, and thorium plot, triangular plot, is important in this case, and it also negates sediment derivation from a mafic or ultramafic source and favors most of the derivation from the felsic or granitic source. Now we have to testify this with other plots. The lanthanum versus scandium, thorium versus cobalt plot is used to discriminate between basic and acidic sediment source. And here the plot indicates that the present sediments are favoring silicic or acidic source derivation. Then the thorium versus uranium plot against the thorium is used to identify the weathering trend. And here it indicates that our sediments are mostly correlating to the slightly weather part of upper continental crust or upper crust. There is not much significant weathering. But to, to testify this, to, to justify this, we have to use the thorium versus scandium and zirconium versus scandium plot because zirconium is generally concentrated in, in zircon, which are the product of Concentration in high weathering and as is the thorium. It is, is uh, concentrated in acidic rock and uh, scandium it preserves its signal. So there is not much compositional variation within the source, but at the same time, there is not much evidence for extensive recycling. So the sediments appear to be derived from one source, silicic rich source, but not much recycling was going on there. Recycling in terms of chemical weathering. I'm not talking about the sediment mixing, which is of course there because of the the sediment derivation from the uh, by a different uh, source, which we we will talk in the coming slides. Then 
we are happy with with the results that there is not much weathering going on, not much mixing of um, uh, source variation. The tectonics uh, plot is is well discriminated by silica versus the potassium versus sodium plot, and it indicates that mostly active continental margin sedimentation was common. Nothing is coming from oceanic island arc and very minimum and passive margin settings. Now let's take the story further. One last time, if that is the case, then rare earth elements should also reflect the same story. Therefore, we use the rare earth plots. The samarium and the UVM are very important in these proxies, and they are clearly negating sediment derivation from passive margins at any sort of basic sources mostly active continental setting is reflected by the sediments and thus we agree that probably nothing was coming from oceanic arc or interplate or wake arc or passive margin setting now if nothing is coming from basic source then there should be very little nickel and chromium and in, in, with in the sediments so the nickel chromium proxy negates ophiolitic trend and supports the continental or the crustal settings. The chromium versus vanadium and the yttrium versus nickel plot will provide a high resolution image if there is anything coming from ultramafic or granites. Now here, I look at the 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 composition of the sediment is in close association, is in close similarity with the post us Australian, post Archean Australian shale, which is considered as the average shale or the upper continental crust, which means that there is a sediment mixing going on during the course of transportation. But of course, it is far away from the ultramafic and far away from the pure granitic source. A little trend toward the granitic is indicated, but this is obvious for the understanding. But the first plot surely negates any contribution from the ophiolitic sediments. Now, what was happening when the sediments were being deposited in the Peshawar Basin? Prior to the uplift of the Atakcharat ranges, the fluvial system had a north to south transport and was depositing sediments in the uh, fluvial or alluvial fan type of settings, which is normal in the foothills of the uplifting origin. Around 2.8 million years ago, the Atakcharat ranges start to uplift, and it forced the drainage system to change its, its course. So the Indus River was only confined to the eastern part of the Peshawar Basin, and it was not supplying much of the sediments to the basin. Dominantly, the Kabul River and it, its tributaries were shedding the detritus derived from the nearby uh, uh, uplifted uh, Peshawar Plain alkaline igneous complex and the other meta sediments. That is why the basic se signals proxies are lacking within the sediments and the acidic proxies are more common because the sediments were generally derived from the Peshawar Plain alkaline igneous complex, mostly in the north and northwestern and northeastern parts and metamorphic associated rocks. To the south, there was some contribution from the slates of the monkey formation in other parts. So in the south, those sediments are also observed. And the present day situation is that within the central part, mostly the lycostrine floodplain sediments dominated by the rhythm arts are present, while in the southern parts, the fanglomerates are the alluvial fan sediments are dominant close to the Atakcharat ranges. And what I believe, these are not focused in the northern parts, but I believe that similar alluvial uh, fan sediments can be expected in the northern parts near Dargai or near the, the, the foothills of the Malakand ranges or other nearby ranges. So, what was happening? 
a flow pattern was different before the uplift of the attacker art ranges. The attacker art ranges confined the, the, the drainage pattern and formed the, the so called lake concept of the Peshawar Basin, flooding of the Peshawar Basin. And in this um, lacustrine sediments, uh, lacustrine environment, the sediments were dominantly supplied by the Kabul River in its tributaries. And this is the present day situation you expect those in the middle part and between there are the Paleozoic outcrop of the Peshawar Basin, which are well known. So the conclusions are that the Indus River, which is generally considered as the main detritus supplier to the Indus Basin, is not directly supplying huge sediment detritus to the Peshawar Basin. If it did, that was only during the breakout floods because they are, are then basic boulders and the boulders which are relating to the Indus River and yes, close to the eastern like in the in the eastern sections like uh, the Jangira section, there are more sandy stuff close to the Indus River and also in the um, Kond um, area and the um, Hund and Swabi areas, while the inner part of the basins, the, the Mardan, Sawabi area, the Noshera, Charsada area, they mostly received sediments from the Kabul River and its tributaries. So this local fluvial system, dominantly consisting of the Kabul Swat River and the tributaries were the major detritus supplier in general. And the detritus reflect a signal, signal dominantly linking to the Peshawar plain alkali and igneous complex in associated metamorphic rocks with some supply in the southern part from the southern uplifting ranges. So those are the conclusions. And yeah, we have already talked about this in the, both the cases. So we shortly conclude that sedimentation within the Peshawar basin during the Pleistocene, Holocene time occurred and dominantly glacial, interglacial and interwound and uh, the deposition was in dominantly lacustrine fluvial setting and the sediments were derived from the nearby up, uplifted architecture art ranges in the southern part and otherwise the Peshawar plain alkali and igneous complex and associated rocks. So that's all for my presentation and thanks for giving me the opportunity. Thanks for your patience and now if there are any discussion, any question, I'll be glad if I can answer. A wonderful, Shahid. Thank you very much for your presentation and your discussion. Uh, I might uh, start some questions and uh, we'll see if other people chime in. I, I was particularly interested in the dropstone uh, faces. You indicated uh, one of your photographs had a, a very large boulder. And uh, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on the, on the character of these events. Uh, Presumably there were flood events coming down the Indus River. Is that true? And, and uh, is this something that is in, in the historic record? Uh, yeah, this is interesting. This is like, have a look at this. Boulder, Tansard, Boulder. We're, we're getting feedback from maybe Kasim John. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, Oh, too much noise here. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate uh, Shahid Iqbal for a very uh, nice, informative talk and plenty of data, many, many uh, diagrams used for justification of his conclusions. I think these, this is sort of Come in. This, these are the sort of studies that we would like to obviously have in the long run. I have a little bit of reservation regarding um, the derivation of the sediments from continental margin. Uh, uh, not that it's impossible. It's not impossible at all because, quite frankly, the Khoistan got continental margin as early as 100 million years ago. 
or 90 million years ago. And then the entire thing closed down when about 55 to 60 million years ago, the, uh, the Indus suture uh, juxtaposed India against uh, the Khoistan arc. But he refers that much of the sediment has been brought from the shower plain, alkaline, igneous province, and there is where I have some reservations. I wouldn't mind if he says that these have been derived from the sediments, surrounding sediments, because I haven't studied those and it's possible. But the Peshawar Plain Alkaline Igdes province is not a continental margin type of um, uh, magmatic association. It is continental rift type of magmatic association. So then, then when she proposes on the one hand that it's continental margin and the, on the other hand it he says that they are the sediments are derived from Peshawar Plain Alkaline Igneous Province, then his model is internally inconsistent because the Peshawar Plain Alkaline Rocks are continental rift related, not to subduction related, not to continental margin. Other than that, I congratulate him. Very nice paper, and I would like to see the details of it, particularly some of the diagrams, which a few were uh, new to me to say so, and I would like to use them at some stage. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, sir. I'll I'll come to uh, your uh, comments, but first, I'm sorry, I couldn't answer uh, uh, the first question. So I will I will continue on oh, answering okay. with the first question, okay. and then 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 I will I will I will uh, share my view on on your comment. So Bob, the boulders which we see here are interesting. They lack the striations which are generally common in glacial sediments. And uh, the composition of these are more closely related to the quartzitic quartz um, uh, rich sandstone of the Peshawar Basin itself, like the uh, uh, Messi Banda quartzite and those sediments. So yes, it appears that these are either derived during the flash floods are probably especially looking at this if there was from flash flood so there would have been much more of those but we in the field work couldn't especially observe like like in this case we have more of them but here that was only one so probably this may be a drop stone by those iceberg floating within the a uh, lake may have uh, deposited it so this is my view. Now coming to Professor Kasim John's uh, uh, question. Yes, sir. You are very right that these uh, uh, um, um, granitic intrusions are intraplate. Yes, uh, the oldest one is the Mansara granite around 516 million years, then followed by the Umbella granitic complex somewhere Carboniferous to late around 300 million years to late, and then the Malakan granite is the youngest. This, yes, sir, you are right that these are not the, uh, the continental margin. These are intra, but I'm saying the setting, the present day setting, not, not the, not the emplacement of these, but in the present day setting, this is a continental margin type of setting. Like are. And uh, secondly, the, I could not alter the terminologies within those plots because those are in the established literature. So when we refer to them, we take the, the, the terminologies from the literature, but we fix them in, in our uh, uh, tectonic settings. And I already said that these are in the a hinterland zone of the Himalayan fold and thrust belt. So that summarizes it. So the internal consistency is partly because of the limitation of the terminology. And yes, of course, you are right that these are different granites. Thanks. Uh, we you. have a question from uh, Kay. Uh, please open your mic and uh, go for your question. OK, uh, thank you. Very, uh, very enjoyable talk. I, I learned quite a lot. Uh, I'm curious, you know, in the in the Sewellic sequence in the pot war, there's a, a boundary where blue green hornblends uh, are, are seen uh, coming into the the sequence and uh, I just wondered, you know, we always have thought that that they were being brought in by the Indus, um, but I just I wondered whether there was any 
indication of uh, that in the Peshawar Basin? Yeah, thanks Kay. Very interesting and very important questions. Heavy mineral association are the footprints of provenance analysis, and these provide very reliable information. I intentionally didn't include it because Alize and colleagues have done detailed analysis in this regard, and yes, hamlets are indication of uh, the amphibolite and higher uh, facies metamorphism within the hinterland, and these are reflected within the Sivalex. Uh, here, Alize have done his studies, and mostly garnets and those uh, heavy minerals are uh, 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 reported by him, and uh, yes, there is a difference between the heavy mineral assemblage of the Andes and Cabral River, so they have done detailed analysis in this regard. I think these are published in Asian Earth Sciences um, 2016. So yes, there is a difference. Um, um, garnet, um, which is uh, generally common in these uh, schistose facial metamorphism are common here in contrast to the hamdan, which are dominant there. OK, thank you. But it's not my work, so I'm just referring to no, the literature. I understand. Uh, you have uh, we have another question from uh, Catherine Bagley. Please open your mic. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes. OK, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for an excellent talk. I had a couple of questions about and you, I'm looking at the scene you have uh, uh, up now. I'm wondering if the lake sediments indicate that this was a uh, in closed drainage basin. And if that was the case, what were the kind of tectonic limits of that basin in your in your fluvial model at the end? We could see the uh, set of a series of high mountains to the north and then the attic range coming up, but it wasn't clear what else was bounding that basin. So I was curious about that. Uh, yeah, this is uh, not a closed, uh, very isolated closed lake. If you see, just the highs are shown in a north-south mm -hmm. section. Just the highs in a north-south section. Uh, if uh, we do field work in the architecture art ranges, there are the boulder, thick boulder bed on top of these ranges. So that surely indicates that the uplet of the architecture art ranges is younger than the establishment of the fluid system here. Uh, in this, these models, I'm, I'm in indicating a change in the drainage, not a discrete closure. Yes, damming occurred. But surely these are like, especially the Indus is a big river system. It has huge water. And similarly, Kabul also in the other tributaries also. So there is a change in the drainage. And that drainage forced the, the their change forced the, the uh, drainage to be confined mostly to the southern part. If we look at the, the course of the Kabul River, mm -hmm. this is far more to the southern part of the basin, mm -hmm. leaving the area of Murtan, uh, Sawabi, most um, uh, eastern part of Charsadda and Noshera. This is so. So that is indicated here. It's not not a, an isolated closed system. And yes, it is indicated by the grain size change toward the Indus River in Jangira. The sediments are coarser, indicating a fluvial okay. influence. Toward the south, there are alluvial fan uh, with flu. I will say with fluvial character, but I didn't intentionally change it because the existing literature says these are alluvial fan. But I and I I see a clear fluvial influence here also, and more more in the central part, where these these big river systems are slightly away. There are the typical lacustrine systems. So this is the situation. OK, great. Well, thank you. Um, second question is, are, are there fossils associated with any of the, these sediments? I'm thinking whether they're uh, fossils. I'm thinking of um, invertebrate fossils or fish fossils in the lake beds or um, even continental fossils in the um, in the alluvial uh, sequences. 
Yeah, I have to admit that uh, I'm not a specialist in, in paleontology, so I didn't do the invertebrate vertebrate. Uh, um, uh, for, that was not the focus of my study, and unluckily I couldn't see them also. Some people, okay. I think, have done the paleo paleontology on these sediments, mm. but you know, mm. paleontology has a different limitation. It, it can be everywhere, things. So I, I won't comment on that, but I, I, I'm not a specialist in that, and I didn't conduct those things. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Shahid, I have another question. This is Bob. I was I'm curious about the the extent and character of the outcrops. Uh, you have beautiful photographs, particularly some of the Kabul River sediments. And in in my experience, the Peshawar Basin is relatively low relief, and I imagine it must be challenging to find good exposures. And then to correlate the exposures from one area to another must also be difficult. And I'm curious to hear a little bit about your perspective on this. And then in some cases, uh, there's been some success with, with coring. And I'm curious to learn if anybody has contemplated uh, a scientific coring program in the Peshawar Basin. Yeah, thanks, Bob. Very, very valid question. Very, very interesting. Actually, we should be familiar with this fluvial system in general in the small continental lake system. You cannot expect every bit everywhere because of the facies limitation, because of the depositional limits. Uh, and sometimes you are lucky, like uh, looking at these photos, this one and this one. We were conducted field work in December, January. Mukhtar was with me. And we were lucky that uh, the local government was constructing a safety wall on the northern margin, northern bank of the Kabul River. So we got this wonderful exposure there. They were excavating. This is sort of seven, eight meter thick exposure. And you can see the river bit. This, this is the fence which they were making. You can see yeah. these are not the outcrop. These are the, the boulders from which they were making the fence. This is the, the river bed, sand, 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 sediments, and then suddenly a flood layer, and then the recent sediment. So that was our luck. And uh, uh, yes, it is challenging to find good old crop, but uh, uh, looking in the existing literature and uh, knowledge of the area, talking to the locals, where are the thick uh, um, ups and downs, uh, looking for the stream cuts, especially in this case, it is interesting. We were expecting one, only one last sequence, but this is the basal part of this old graph. So alluvial fan sediments, then there are lust deposits, then the lacustrine, floodplain sediments and then again less deposits. So luckily we could see uh, so deposits which were uh, 25 to 30 meter thick, but we didn't force the correlation from wide widespread areas. We tried to confirm them, but not extended them. Uh, and yeah, okay. of course, uh, I tried to approach Warta because they have done some uh, boreholes for the, I think for this uh, SCAR program, Serenity Control and Reclamation Project and also some other aspects. But uh, I, I wasn't successful since I was out of the country. I was in Vienna during this work, so it was taking time and I was looking for finishing this work quickly, so I couldn't get um, a record from them. OK, thank you. Welcome. Uh, we have another question from Gary Johnson. Uh, please uh, open your mic. OK, yes, thank you. Uh, very enjoyable. Uh, just like many of us in this uh, conference call, we've traversed the Chower Basin quite a bit. And I noticed from your geological map of the basin that uh, those very late Pleistocene, Holocene sediments are quite discontinuous and probably only represent you know, like I didn't really calculate it, but you know, 20% of the outcrop potential that's within the basin itself. Moreover, you worked with something less than 25 meters worth of sediment. 
and when you consider the sort of the disparate distribution of the sediments you had to work with, it seems to me that there was a very extensive period of erosion within the basin that occurred essentially post-glacial. Uh, why don't we say Holocene or sub-recent, which is therefore caused this rather incomplete record across the entire base. And you're, you're, you've got outcrops here and there, but not many continuous outcrops that go across the base. Do you have any uh, sense of the timing of that uh, erosional record? I, I think we all agree it's, it's obviously post-glacial, so within the last 10,000 years or so, but is there any more specific uh, ideas that you might have concerning this uh, sort of denudation of the basin center, which is basically what's going on today? Uh, thanks, Johnson. Yeah, we, when we are working with siliciclastic anywhere, fluvial anyway, so we should look that at least we are missing 50 to 80 percent of the rock, rock record because fluvial sedimentation is not continuous in any case, so we are already missing rock record. On top of that, there are tectonic activities repeatedly, which are reflected, yeah. So this is sort of start of the alluvial fan facies, then uplift around 600 <clears throat> kilo years, then another event. So these events have number one, change the system from depositional to erosional, and in between the flood systems also, the floods also in the reworking of the, the, the during the last 10 to 20,000 years have also forced the erosion of the sediment. So saying that record is continuous is not wise. But even then we have to deal with these sediments. And uh, yes, we should be careful, like particularly looking at this outcrop. Generally, at least my concept was that there are on top of these deposits, there are less. But now I can see clearly that there is less deposit. And then Lekustar and floodplain and there are less. So there is a pass, a change from depositional to uh, erosional uh, setting. So this, this, this thing is there and uh, where this thing was, we, was we were trying to look for um, a correlation between these event and uh, the thermoluminescence setting, which I think you people and uh, Burbank and other people have done the magnetic stratigraphy. We didn't do the, the revised age dating because of the funding limits and because of the other problems. And we trusted the, the existing A uh, dating, the, the TL dating, and other techniques which were used in magnetic susceptibility. So we, are, but surely we find these uh, uh, change from the depositional to erosional settings, and one has to be careful while dealing with those. Yeah. So that is there. Okay, well, thank you. Welcome. Um, Bob, I think we don't have any other question. I'll I'll just ask a final question. Uh, maybe uh, Shahid, you could comment on the the loess accumulation. I think one of the things that we've observed across the entire Potwar region is a a very late stage loess accumulation that mantles the uh, upper Shawalix. and I'm I'm sort of curious to hear your thoughts on on the paleogeography of the of the uh, of the region during glacial times, and do you envision that the the Lus represents um, cold and arid times, but and then the lake episodes represent the uh, higher precipitation? What what's your general interpretation of this uh, alternation between uh, wind blown and lacustrine sedimentation? I mean, is there a a good model in your mind for how that works and 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 then the question of in my mind is well how regional is it because certainly the loess extends across all the way to Jellum across the potwar uh yeah i this uh, we i at least tried to look for the differences especially in this uh, the floodplain and uh, the lust deposits and if we look at 
these are the three sections, section one, section two, section three, and every section, the where we have the lust deposit, there is a spike in carbonate content. And the liquestrine, we don't have. The red one is liquestrine, but in, in the lust deposits, we have a spike. Now, calcite will generally not deposit in dissolutional conditions. Rather, it will prefer evaporatic or arid conditions. And when we think about a drier condition, what could be the possible mechanism for it? So apparently, if we look at the timing, timing says that it is, I think, 67 kilo years to as young as three kilo years. And this is the time around the, the latest peak of the glaciation around 20 to 30 kilo years. So what we did, we intentionally didn't dissolve the, the carbonate content during the clay mineralogy to look for whether if it is indigenous or if it is transported. And yes, it is reflecting the arid conditions during these severe glacial conditions where there was uh, more glaciation and less water coming and the water levels were very low. And uh, the lakes, yes, these are also um, uh, related to those dominantly glacial, but uh, the, these small interglacial are little optimum period where there were more water supply. The water availability was there, but the water was not warm. It could not force chemical weathering in dissolution. And mostly sluggish because we don't see any rootlets, any big trees which could otherwise be common in humid and moist conditions. So it was subaqueous mostly. And it was relatively cold condition. In the floodplain lithofishes, on the other hand, we see some oxidation, some reddening. So this is sort of more exposed, the floodplain type of settings when the fluvial channels were mostly active and when the either the uplift was going on, either uh, there was less water, both both of these settings, but this is a little bit different from the, the aqueous sediment. So these three discrimination can be observed in, in the clay mineralogy and also in the outcrop. Well, very good. No, I, I think uh, if I don't see any other questions, I'm going to uh, uh, again congratulate you on your presentation. I'm particularly delighted to see the your block diagrams. I think that those kinds of diagrams allow you to uh, create a, a vision in people's minds and 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 pose the questions like like Catherine asked about well how how big were these lakes and I think that it's it's amazing to think about the the Peshawar basin as as being a, a essentially a, a piggyback basin riding on the and on the, the Atog range as, as you showed so I, I congratulate you for that and I think that there's lots of potential for additional work uh, studying those ancient lake sediments. Uh, if I don't see any other questions, I'm going to uh, draw the seminar to a close this evening and this morning. And I want to again thank all of our participants from across the world. Uh, we, Shahid is coming to us from Vienna. We have participants on the east coast of the United States. And uh, of course, many people in Pakistan and perhaps one or two people in India who are joining us. So uh, thank you all for your participation. And we'll look forward to seeing you uh, a week from today uh, when we have uh, Yanni Naiman giving her talk uh, on the uh, regional uh, sedimentation patterns in the Shawaliks. So we will see you all uh, next week. And thank you for joining us again. And thank congratulations you, thank you. on thank the you. talk. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.